Hello friends, Mircea here. So, in this video, I want to talk a bit about Kubernetes. More specifically, I want to talk about deploying a Kubernetes cluster. In one of my previous videos, I mentioned that one of my goals for this year in my home lab, or rather what's left of this year, was to migrate as much of my infrastructure as I reasonably can to Kubernetes. So, today I will be exploring a possibly better way to do just that. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, let's go. Typically when we're deploying a Kubernetes cluster, we pick a base operating system, such as Ubuntu for example, and then we install it, we configure it, we harden it, we set up kubeadm or k3s or some other tool to facilitate the Kubernetes deployment, and finally we bootstrap Kubernetes. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with this approach. It's a reasonable path to take, but I would argue that it's probably not the best path to take. Let me explain. First off, you're either manually doing all of the steps required to configure the machine and bootstrap Kubernetes, which is extremely error prone, or hopefully you're using some sort of automation to do it for you. The problem here is that you now have to either develop your own automation for this or use somebody else's code. If you decide to do it yourself, then that's fine, but that's yet more work to do to get things up and running. And I'd honestly like to minimize that. Don't get me wrong, it's great for learning automation and learning the tool itself and how Kubernetes works, but if you just want to deploy Kubernetes and then move on, I'd argue it's not the nicest solution. If you're using somebody else's code, then now you have the problem that you've just put your trust into a third party to maintain and update the code base. And more often than not, that third party is just some guy on the internet. And I would much rather have a first party integration or a first party solution for this. Secondly, and I find this one rather interesting, when it comes to our container images, the general consensus in the community is that it's best to use a minimal and purpose-built operating system. But when it comes to the cluster itself, we don't really think about it the same way. For example, say you have a Golang application and you want to package it in a Docker container. If you're using Ubuntu as the base of your Docker image, well, that's not ideal. Going for Alpine is a lot better, but going for Scratch directly is probably the best option. When it comes to the base for our Kubernetes system, we don't really have the same mindset. We go for a general purpose operating systems, and then we try to make them fit our specific needs somehow, instead of going for a minimal and purpose-built solution in the first place. At the end of the day, I want to deploy Kubernetes my infrastructure. I don't want to deploy Ubuntu. I don't really care what underlying operating system my cluster is running on, so I find that there's very little added value in me spending the time to do all of the operations manually. Ideally, I would like to just install an operating system that is already hardened, already secure, already has Kubernetes in there, you know, no manual steps required. Kind of like, you know, if I want storage in my infrastructure, I deploy TrueNAS, or if I want Firewall, I deploy OpenSense. Essentially, what I'm looking for is an operating system that would give me more or less of a Kubernetes appliance. Well, that's when I came across Talos Linux. In short, Talos Linux is simply Linux but designed for Kubernetes. It's a minimal operating system since it essentially contains just what is needed to run Containerd and a very very small subset of system services. It's an OS built specifically to run containers and nothing else. It's secure by default, there's no SSH access, there isn't even a shell. Talos is an API-driven OS, and this means that all of the management and the configuration for the operating system is done via an API that is extremely similar to the Kubernetes one, and all of the access is managed using RBAC. Talos is also immutable and ephemeral. This means that it mounts the root file system as a read-only, and then it runs in memory. This, alongside the Atomic Update model, allows us to manage the OS upgrades similar to how we're managing Helm releases, for example. When we want to do an OS upgrade, Talos uses an uh, AB scheme and retains the previous image so that it can be easily rolled back. If an upgrade fails, we can do a rollback and go back to where we were. And finally, what's probably my most favorite feature, is that everything, and I mean absolutely everything, is configured via a YAML file. The OS will pull this YAML configuration down on each boot and it will make sure that whatever state we designed in the configuration file is the state that the OS is currently in. This 
effectively removes the possibility of configuration drift and Snowflake servers. This list of features goes on and on and I recommend that you check the official website to get a complete list, but I think that these are the main ones that really caught my eye. It's a minimal operating system that is secure by default and it's packaged together with Kubernetes, so I don't have to worry about that. It's API driven with an interface that is extremely similar to that of Kubernetes and it's configured via a YAML file which we can easily store in Git alongside our app manifests. And as if that wasn't enough, it can even run on Raspberry Pi. The Sidero team provides Raspberry native images, so that's a perfect use case for the newly announced Raspberry Pi 5 for example. But that's enough talk, let's get on with it and create our Talos cluster. For this demo, I will be deploying a 3-node Talos cluster. Then, we will bootstrap Kubernetes on top of that cluster. And finally, we'll configure our local workstation to talk to the Kubernetes API and we'll deploy an Nginx web server to our cluster and make sure we can access it. If you want to follow along, there are a few things that you will need. First, you'll need the latest Talos ISO image, which is 1.5.3 at the time of making the video. You can download it by going to their GitHub page and going to the releases section. You'll want to either flash this image onto a USB drive using a tool like Balena Etcher for example, if you're going to use a bare metal server or Raspberry Pi, or just upload it into your hypervisor if you are using a virtual machine. For this demo, I will be using Proxmox. Next, you will need at least one server or virtual machine to install Talos on. For this demo, I will be setting up three virtual machines. Each of the virtual machines will have 8 CPU cores, 16 gigs of RAM, and a 32 GB boot disk. The only thing to be aware here is that you have to set the CPU type to either host if you're using an older version of Proxmox or x86-64 v2 if you are on 8.0 or newer. If you miss this step and use any of the KVM type CPUs, Talos will just boot loop and it won't work. And uh, one more note here, I also made some reservations in my DHCP server to give my VMs the IP addresses of 10.0.10.11 through 10.0.10.13. Finally, you will need to install two utilities onto your workstation. The first one is Talos CTL, which will allow us to interact with the Talos API and manage the operating system. The second one is kubectl, which will allow us to interact with the Kubernetes API and manage the Kubernetes cluster. If you want to copy paste commands to set this up quickly, you can find the commands in the blog post linked in the description of this video. With all that out of the way, let's get straight to installing Talos. The first step is to create the secrets bundle. This is a file that contains all of the sensitive information, such as keys and certificates, that are needed to define the cluster. To generate it, we need to run the Talos CTL gen secrets command. Now, we need to generate the YAML file which will configure our entire cluster. Cluster both in terms of Talos and in terms of Kubernetes. To do that, we can run the Talos CTL genconfig command. And this command has two required parameters that we need to specify. The name of the cluster, and secondly, the Kubernetes endpoint which will be used to bootstrap Kubernetes later on. Let's first talk about the cluster name since that's the most straightforward one to understand. Similar to how we're using kubectl to manage multiple Kubernetes clusters, so can we manage multiple Talos clusters using Talos CTL. And in both cases, switching between clusters is done using contexts, and contexts are identified by the cluster name. For this demo, I'll just call my cluster demo cluster. Next, let's talk about the Kubernetes endpoint. This should be either the DNS name or the IP address of a load balancer that is placed in front of the control plane nodes of your Kubernetes cluster to ensure high availability. If you're setting up a single node cluster, then you can set the IP address of that node, but since we're using three nodes, we won't really be doing that. And given that the whole premise of this video was to set up and maintain as little infrastructure as possible, we will be using a nifty little feature of Talos and we'll set up a VIP or a virtual IP address to load balance our control plane nodes. Since my nodes have the IP addresses of 10.0.10.11, 10.0.10.12 and 10.0.10.13, I will be using 10.0.10.10 as the IP address for my Kubernetes VIP. One final note here is that 
we have to use the Kubernetes endpoint when we specify this one. This means that we have to use the HTTPS protocol and we have to specify the port 6443. Now, to customize the default configuration that this command would generate, we can either just generate the configuration as is and then manually go through all of the YAML files, or can do it more elegantly using configuration patches. So let's do that. In the first patch, we simply want to allow pods to be scheduled on control plane nodes. Now, by default, control plane nodes have a taint that prevent workload from getting assigned to them. With this patch, we can remove that taint so any pod can be scheduled on any control plane node. We're doing this because we're running a three node HA cluster and all nodes will be both control planes and data planes. Next, let's enable kubelet certificate rotation and then we need to ensure that new certificates are automatically approved. So we will deploy kubelet service insert approver automatically using the extra manifest configuration. To configure the network interfaces for our machines, what I typically like to do is that I disable predictable interface names by setting the kernel argument net if names to zero. This essentially makes sure that all of the interfaces have similar names, such as ETH0 or ETH1, as opposed to ETH and then the MAC address. Having similar interface names on all of my machines allows me to create one generic configuration that can apply to all of them, instead of having to have one configuration for each node. To ensure high availability across the control plane nodes, I will configure the virtual API I mentioned earlier. This will act as my Kubernetes API load balancer and Talos will create it automatically once Kubernetes is up and running. To configure it, all I have to do is that I have to specify the VIP IP address under the network interfaces section. And to wrap up the networking section, I want to enable DHCP on the interface ETH0 on all of my nodes. Since I already created the static lists in my DHCP server, my nodes will get both their IP address and their hostname from that. For our cluster networking solution, Talos uses Flannel by default, but we can actually override that and deploy something else or just disable it entirely if we want to manually deploy our CNI after the fact. I will create a dedicated patch to deploy Calico on my cluster so that we're ready to go once the installation is complete. And finally, the last thing to do is to specify the disk on which we want our OS to be installed. To get a list of all of the available disks we have on the machines, we can use the talosctl disks command against any of the control plane nodes, and then we have to specify the dash dash insecure parameter since the PKI has not yet been initialized. In this case, I will create a patch that will be using dev sda as the installation target for my nodes. With all of the patches in place in our patches directory, we can go ahead and generate our config file. All in all, the command is pretty long, but it should look something like this. So we have talosctl genconfig, then we have the name of the cluster, which in my case was demo cluster. Then we have the Kubernetes endpoint, which is HTTPS, then 10.0.10.10, .10 .10, and then port 6443. Next, we have to point it to the secrets bundle we created at the first step using the dash dash with secrets flag. And now strap in because we have to pass in all of the config patches we created earlier. So we have to pass in dash dash config patch, then we have to specify the at symbol, that way Talos interprets it as a YAML patch instead of a JSON patch, and then point it to the configuration patch you want, but make sure that when you are passing in the VIP patch, you are using the dash dash config patch control plane flag, since that's a config patch that is specific for the control plane component and not for the worker nodes. And finally, we also have to specify the dash dash output to point it to an output directory where all of the configuration will be printed. Again, this is a long command, but the important bits here are that we specified the secrets bundle we generated at the first step, that we passed in all of the config files, and that we used an at symbol in front of them to be interpreted as YAML manifests and not as JSON patches. This command has now generated three files for us. We have the control plane.yaml, which is the machine config file for the control plane nodes of the cluster. And then again, I mean cluster both in terms of Talos and in terms of Kubernetes. Then we have the worker.yaml, which is the machine config file for the worker nodes of the cluster. And finally, we have the Talos config, which is the equivalent of a kube config file in the Talos world. Now, if we take a closer look at it, we can see that it simply specifies the endpoint at which the Talos API is available, which is actually wrong, but we'll talk more about that a bit later. And we have the credentials that the utility will use to authenticate itself against the API. 
we can go ahead and apply this configuration to our machines with the talosctl apply command. So we have talosctl apply, then dash f to specify the configuration file which you want to push, in my case that's rendered slash control plane, since rendered is a directory where I put all of the config files and control plane is the role that this cluster node will have. Then I pass in dash n to specify the node against which I want to push the file. So that would be 10.0.10.11 in my case for the first control plane node. And then I have to pass in dash dash insecure since the PKI has not yet been initialized. And now we just need to run that command two more times, once for each node in the cluster. And since the command follows the Unix principle of no output is good output, the fact that we got no response here means that nothing went wrong essentially. Our nodes have received the config file and they have started configuring themselves. At this point, Talos is getting installed onto the VMs, so what we can do in the meantime is that we can configure the Talos CTL utility to work with our new cluster. To do that, let's first put the Talos config file in the right place for Talos CTL to pick it up automatically. Similar to how kubectl expects the kube config file to be in .kube slash config, Talos CTL expects it at .talos slash config. So all that we need to do is to create the .talos directory in our home directory, and then we need to move our talos config file in there. Now, you may remember from a few moments ago when I mentioned that the talos API endpoint is actually not set correctly in this config file. By default, it is set to localhost, which is not what we want. This should be the IP address or DNS name of a load balancer that is placed in front of the talos control plane nodes this time. If you set up an external load balancer previously for your Kubernetes control plane nodes, then you can use that here as well. However, if you set up a VIP, do not use that here, since the VIP requires Kubernetes to be up and running to function. So, if you have some issue with your Kubernetes cluster, then you will lose access to the Talos API as well, and that's not what we want. To see what we currently have configured in our Talos config file, we can run the Talos CTL config context command. This command will show us all of the configured contexts in our config file, similar to the Kubernetes context. And here we can see that our demo cluster has the endpoint set to localhost. What we can do to fix it is that we can pass a list of IP addresses of all of our control plane nodes to the Talos CTL utility. That way, it will automatically load balance the request between them. To configure that list of endpoints, I will run Talos CTL config endpoint command and then I will specify all of the IP addresses of all of my control plane nodes. And finally, to check that the configuration has been updated, I will run the talos ctl config context command again. And we can see here the endpoints are now correctly set. What we can do now is that we can interact with our talos cluster using the talos ctl command. For example, we can now remotely access the talos dashboard using the talos ctl dashboard command. Here, we can see a live feed of all of the logs for our machine. And with that, our cluster should now be up and running. To check that all of the nodes have joined, we can issue a talos ctl get members command against either one of the control plane nodes. And here, we can see that all of the nodes have joined. With that, let's get straight to installing Kubernetes. Once Talos is installed and all of the nodes have joined the cluster, the bulk of the work is actually complete. The process of setting up Kubernetes on the Talos cluster is now simplified down to a single command. What we need to do is that we need to pick one of our control plane nodes, doesn't matter which one, and then issue a Talos CTL bootstrap command against it. This will initiate the bootstrapping of the cluster and start the Kubernetes services as static pods. Once that's done, we can monitor the progress by running a Talos CTL dashboard command again, or just navigate to the console of the VMs in Proxmox. While the cluster is being set up, let's take a quick look at what is happening under the hood. As soon as we have issued the bootstrap command against one of the control plane nodes, the etcd process on that bootstrap node has initiated the cluster. Then, the manifests for the Kubernetes control plane services were rendered to disk to be started as static pods by the kubelet on the bootstrap node. As soon as the Kubernetes API is up and running, the VIP, which we configured earlier, also becomes available. At this point, the etcd processes on the other control plane nodes can now discover and join the etcd cluster. The manifests for the Kubernetes control plane components are now rendered to disk as well on the other control plane nodes, so they can now join the cluster, and once they're up and running, the cluster essentially becomes highly available. At this point, we can see that the Talos boot process has finished. Kubernetes should now be up and running. 
to get access to the cluster, we need to somehow fetch the kubeconfig file from it. Luckily, the talosctl command can do that for us easily. All we need to do is that we need to run the talosctl kubeconfig command against any one of the control plane nodes of the cluster. This command has now fetched a kubeconfig file from the cluster and put it in .kube/config in our home directory. So we can now just start issuing kubectl commands right away. Now that we have the kubeconfig file, let's just run a kubectl get nodes command to make sure that all of the nodes are ready. And here we can see that all of the nodes have joined the cluster, they're all in a ready state, and they are all running Kubernetes version 1.28.2, which is the latest one at the time of making this video. And if we're taking a look at all of the pods running in the cluster, we can see that we only have the core KATS components and our Calico CNI. Now that Kubernetes is up and running, let's just go ahead and deploy some workloads to our cluster to make sure that everything is working fine. We'll just deploy an nginx web server. To do that, we'll run a kubectl create deployment command. We'll pass in the name of our deployment as nginx demo. We'll set the image to the latest nginx image. And finally, we'll set the replicas count to one. Once that's done, let's validate that the pod has been scheduled and started by running the kubectl get pods and pass in the dash o wide flag to also take a note on the node on which it was scheduled. And we can see here that the pod is up and running. Next, let's expose the deployment with a node port type service. To do that, we need to run the kubectl expose deployment command, passing in the name of our deployment we just created, so nginx demo, setting the service type to node port, and finally setting the port we need to expose, which in our case is port 80, as that's the port that nginx is listening on. Now, let's make sure that the service has been successfully created and let's also take a note on the port that got assigned to it. Now, we should be able to access our Nginx web server by going to the IP address of the node on which the pod was scheduled, followed by the port number that was associated with the service. And voila, here we see the Nginx welcome page. And that's about it for this one. We just deployed a Talos cluster in our infrastructure. We bootstrapped Kubernetes on top of it, and finally we even deployed some workloads on our brand new cluster to test it out. And the best part, we now have the machine config files, so we can tear down and redeploy the cluster anytime you want. Now, while the cluster itself is technically functional, since we deployed workloads to it, it's still missing some crucial services, like a storage solution for stateful applications, or an ingress controller, just to name a few. In one of my upcoming videos, or a few of them rather, since I plan to make this a small series, we'll dive a bit deeper into this topic and we'll look for solutions to deploy all of the services we might need onto our cluster and doing that in an automated way. Let me know if you're interested in learning more about performing operations on the cluster, like adding or removing nodes or performing backups and disaster recovery or system upgrades and rollbacks. I think that this video is getting long enough already, so I'll just wrap it up here, but I'd be down to make more videos exploring those topics in the future. Let me know in the comment section down below, and on your way down there, don't forget to like this video if you liked it, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you so much for watching, and have a wonderful day. If you enjoyed this video, you'll likely want to watch this other one, where I talk about my home lab plans for this year, to get a glimpse at some of the projects that might be coming down the line. Again, thank you so much for watching, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.